Today, we're going to continue finding the volume of a solid formed by rotating a region about an axis. Our first strategy is to slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation. I didn't build this originally as the first strategy. I just said this is the way, uh, but there is another. When we slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation, we have to consider two cases. One where the axis is a boundary of the region and another where the axis is not a boundary of the region. So if we draw a slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation, there's our delta variable. I've drawn it as a delta y in this case, since it's going up, uh, up and down. But when we have uh, the axis as a boundary of the region, then the volume of the slice, what we're doing is we're taking this rectangle and rotating it around so that we get the other image or the rest of the cylinder shows up on that side. So when the axis is a boundary, the shape is a disc. And we can get the volume by taking the cross-sectional area multiplied by the height. So the volume, uh, when we're doing a disc, the volume of the slice is just pi times the radius squared times the height, in this case, is delta y. Where the radius is always measured from the axis of rotation. So here is the radius from the axis of rotation to the end of the slice. Anything that you're gonna label a radius in this technique and any other should be measured from an axis about which things are rotating. But it's the same strategy that we used before. We want to use multiplication, but the size of the circle keeps changing, but it's always gonna be a pi r squared. Then we would have to write r, the radius, in terms of the variable y. We know that we're gonna to have to involve the function in some fashion because the radius is a horizontal and the delta y is a vertical. In the case where the axis is not a boundary of the region, what we're gonna get is a washer, which is just a disc with a hole in it. So if I make a slice in the region, just like I did before, with the same delta y, just because of the way I've drawn my axes here, then when we rotate this region about this axis, there's gonna be this gap as this near, the side of the slice that's nearest the axis of rotation has to go all the way around to the other side. And so we're gonna see this other side of the washer be detached from the axis of rotation. So the slice that we're looking at when the axis is not a boundary of the washer is uh, not a boundary of the region is a washer, which is a disc with a hole in it. So for the volume of the slice, when the axis is not a boundary and we're slicing perpendicular, the volume of the slice, we're gonna have two radii, one inner radius, where we go from the axis to the near end of the slice and an outer radius where we go from the axis to the far end of the slice. And we'll just subtract those two uh, areas. So I'll have pi r squared times delta y. And we'll subtract the inner washer, pi times little r squared times delta y. We have, end up with two terms. Each of the terms has a factor of pi and a factor of delta y, so we can factor those out. So I can write this as pi times r squared minus little r squared 
times delta y. Then we have the same, the same problem that we had before. We have to write r and little r in terms of y. r and little r are both horizontal variables in this case, but y is a vertical variable. So we're gonna to have to translate those horizontals to a vertical. So these are the two things that can happen when we are slicing perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Let's do an example. So I'm gonna use the region that we had yesterday and I'm just gonna change the axis of rotation. So the region is gonna be bounded by the graph of y equals the square root of x, the line y equals three, uh, three and the y-axis. And I wanna find the volume of the solid by rotating the region about the line. Yesterday I did one above, I did five. So I'll go with uh, negative, negative one. So let's draw what this looks like in the uh, in the xy plane. So So this upper, uh, upper almost triangular triangle is the region. And we wanna rotate it about the line y equals negative one. So I'm just gonna draw a negative one, my axis of rotation down here. This is gonna be at y equals negative one. And this is about what we are rotating. Right now, the only strategy that we have is to slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So I'm just gonna draw in a generic slice, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And I'm gonna, calc I'm gonna get that, the area, and I'm gonna assume that the area is constant for some small change in X. So it looks like we are writing a delta X. We're gonna be writing a delta X integral. And we notice that the axis of rotation is not a boundary of the region. So we notice that the axis of rotation is not a boundary of the region. So the things that we notice, we are slicing, we are slicing perpendicular to the axis. And we notice that the axis is not a boundary of the region. That tells us what to write down for the volume of the slice. So that tells us that the volume of the slice will be pi times big R squared minus little r squared times the delta variable, which in this case is delta x. Now I need to go to my picture and I say, well, here's my volume of the slice. It involves a big R and a little r. So I need to label those two things on my diagram. Little r is gonna go from the axis of rotation to the near end of the slice. So little r I'm gonna label the, the distance from the axis of rotation to the near end of the slice. Big r 
is from the axis of rotation to the far end of the slice. And this is all just remind ourselves, notice that everything, the slice has to be drawn inside the region. Just to remind you, the most common mistake is that you'll draw the, uh, you will not label your picture. You'll start imitating me when, I'm, when I draw the picture, but you won't know how to, where to put your labels. And so you just won't label anything and you'll just guess at where, what the R should be. That, uh, wait, uh, that's the most common mistake. The other most common mistake is that you'll draw the picture, but you'll not, you're, you're not gonna remember what, the, what the, the elements of the picture are supposed to represent. You won't shade your region, so you won't know where to draw the slice. The slice has to be drawn inside the region. So now that I've got the specifics for this problem, I need to translate my vertical Rs into horizontal Xs. So I need a relationship between vertical and horizontal, and that is going to be from the function. So I need to label a point on the graph that intersects the slice. So X is the distance from the origin, the horizontal distance from the origin to the slice, and Y will be the vertical distance from the origin to the slice. Now, I can start writing my Rs in terms of Y and then use the function to turn the Y into an X. So right here, Rs need to be written in terms of X. We need to write R and R in terms of X. We want to notice that R and R are vertical uh, variables. But X is horizontal. So first we write R in terms of Y and we translate, use the function to turn Y into X. These are all the things that have, to, that have to go on, and these are the ways that we think about them. Slice perpendicular to the axis, and the axis is not a boundary, tells us we need to use r squared minus little r squared. We need to write r and r in terms of x, because that's what we need to do um, for the definite integral. Everything needs to be in terms of x. We're only allowed one variable. Since r and little r are vertical, but x is horizontal, we're gonna write R and R in terms of Y, then use the function to write Y in terms of X. And then very cleverly, we're gonna run out of space. So have to switch pages halfway through, so. As usual, if you had a professional teacher, they would have planned this out better. But I only, I said, yeah, I could fit this in half a page, but I clearly cannot. So let's write big R and little r in terms of Y and then use the function y equals square root of x to write big R and little r in terms of x. And then we will have a function that we can integrate. So I need to write big R in terms of y. Notice that big R is from the axis of rotation to the far end of the slice and the far end of the slice is always at three. So big R is just the difference between three and the axis of rotation, negative one. So it's three minus a negative one or four. Big R is constant in this case. Little r, the top part of little r is the 
near edge end of the slice. And that is always sitting on the graph of y equals square root of x. So the top of little r is at y and the bottom of little r is at negative one. The difference between those two is y minus a negative one. So we could write that as y plus one. So now we've written r and r in terms of y. Now we can use the function to write y in terms of x. Because I'm integrating this integral of r squared minus r squared delta x, I can't have this y function for little r. So this is where I'll use the function y equals the square root of x. And I can write little r as the square root of x plus 1. So my volume of the slice with these parts in play is pi times four squared minus square root of x squared, plus, uh, square root of x plus one squared times delta x. Then we make a Riemann sum. Then we integrate, we add up all such, by adding all such slices. And then we turn that into a definite integral. We're integrating delta x. So we have to integrate over all the x's for which there was a slice. And x goes from zero down here, x equals zero to x equals nine. So our total volume I'm going to factor out the pi and then we'll integrate x equals 0 to 9, this expression. I'm going to write it as 16 minus the square root of x plus 1 squared. And then the delta x, the discrete delta x, becomes a continuous dx in the definite integral. We could do this by hand if we wanted to flex our mad integration skills, but this is why we have a calculator. Clearly I should want to use a calculator for this because yesterday I was doing 1.25 divided by two. So. so I'll have pi math nine for the integral. I want 16 minus the square root of x, close the courtesy parentheses plus one squared with respect to x from zero to nine. Thinks about that for a while. 183.78 five significant figures. We divide this by pi, looks like 58 and a half. So it looks like 58 and a half pi. So what would that be, 117? Ah, look, it did fit, lucky us. Any questions? What we're trying to do here is not necessarily find the volume of this solid because there are a lot of ways we could do that. We could 3D print one of these things and then stick it in water to find its volume. There's a lot, there are a lot of ways we could actually find the volume. Finding the volume is not the point setting up the definite integral using analytic geometry is the point. Any questions?
in, in which form did you want us to provide the answer? The 183.78 or the 117 over two times pi? Uh, the 183.78. Okay. In, these, in this style of problem, I will always ask for your answer rounded to five significant figures. Understood. Thank you. And I want it to be done this way. Not because this is fast, but I want to try to save y'all some time. Got because it. I've seen, I know that you all can do the integration parts. So I'll just ask separate questions. Integrate this function. And then later on, it's like, oh, just now evaluate it from zero to nine. Got it. We have technology and we should use it. Moreover, you're in this class, you're probably going into some kind of technology field. You're gonna work on AI, so you're gonna work on Google and you're gonna solve the very important problem of make people click on YouTube videos more. Of all the things that AI could do for us, keep in mind that the best minds in AI are, are pretty much trying to get you to click on things so that Google could make more money. And then we quietly notice that Google does not have as a company motto, don't be evil anymore. Yeah, about that don't be evil thing, I think we're gonna to have to stop saying that. Incidentally, don't be evil is exactly what an evil person would say, you know. Oh, right, alphabet. <laughs> We're now a new company with a completely different mindset. Chaotic neutral. All right. What are we talking about? Oh, yes. Hey, at least we all know that we're, suppo we're supposed to say that we value education. At, at least we all know that that's what we're supposed to say. I mean, we don't do anything about it, but at least we say that. I think I've said it many times. Um, when I'm in charge of the world, college education is not free because free is still expensive. College education is a paying job. I pay you to be a college student. Not so much that it's some kind of Van Wilder situation where you're like in college for seven years just partying because that's not, that's not the idea. But so, event, but I pay you that way, if you are intending to spend seven years just partying in college, after a certain amount of time, I can uh, sit down with you and say, oh, listen, Mr. Wilder, it looks like you're not making any effort to graduate. So you're fired. And then you don't get to party at my campus anymore. So it's not enough just to make something free. If you want people to spend time doing something, pay them to do it. It's fine if you want capitalism, but if you want people to do something, you have to pay them to do it. That's the whole point. So anyway. And for those of you who are worried about my colleges that are paying students to be there so that they don't have to have other jobs, by the way, because I want this to be your job. I know some of you are not spending as much time doing calculus because you have to go do other things. That's why I'm paying you so you don't have to do those other things. I couldn't run for, I would never win as president. So there's no possible way I could ever win any kind of public office ever. I've been recorded and put on the internet. Someone will take something I said out of context and that'll be the end of it. <clears throat> I think I actually might pass like a background check, but I think I'm too easily provoked into being kind of um, 
I'm too polarizing, I think I would be. I would have to copy to not being able to play Bard and not understanding how Bard works. <clears throat> and um, I think politically, I'm actually left. I'm actually left-leaning. I just, just have to admit that. And in the United States, there's no place for lefties. That's just a fact. There is no left political party in the United States. The, mo the, the, the leftists are called radical leftists because they're center right. So just keep that in mind. You can count on one hand national leftists. Anyway, what are we talking about? I'm not that far left. That's a little too far. Because there's like a punk aesthetic to anarchy where I do not want people going into a deli and urinating on the food. I think that's just too far. And I think we all need to get together and stop that. Anyway, what are we talking about? Oh yes, we are in the midst of spending way too much time finding volumes of solids of revolution. They have this like almost as like a throwaway topic as part of one section in the book. And it's like, this is such an interesting topic and we can get so much out of it by doing these silly problems. But I think people discount them as silly problems so they don't spend any time, uh, uh, they don't spend an inordinate amount of time looking at them like I do, but you're stuck in my class. So here we go. So I want to continue working with the same region because there's mileage that we can get out of this thing. And we understand what it looks like. So let's do the same region, but this time I'm gonna rotate it about a vertical line that will not be a boundary of the region. So let's see, I'm gonna draw the same region with y equals square root of x. Also, I'm getting better at drawing this region. So I wanna to continue to utilize that still. All right, so I want the same region This time rotated about the axis. X equals nine. So I'm going to take my same region. I'm going to draw my axis. I'm going to indicate that this is about the line about which I'm rotating. I'm going to remind myself that this is where X equals, this is X equals nine. Right now, the only strategy that we have is to slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation. But notice that perpendicular to the axis of rotation in this case is going to be a delta y integral. So let's make a note. We're going to slice perpendicular to the x-axis. Sorry, slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And so, and we're going to, so we're going to notice that since there are two cases when we slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation, we're going to notice that the boundary is not a region, uh, sorry, the axis is not a boundary of the region. So it's not y equals three and it's not the y axis. And it would be weird to rotate it around this curvy line. And that would involve some other stuff. So the boundary, sorry, once again, the axis is not the ba a boundary. So based on these two things, since I am slicing perpendicular to the axis, since we don't have a choice at this point, our volume of the slice
is pi times r squared minus r squared. And we're gonna notice that since we're slicing perpendicular to a vertical axis, we have a delta y. So here is what our slice is gonna look like when I assume things are constant for some small change in the variable. So here's a delta y. Now, We need to write r and r in terms of y. r and r are gonna be horizontal, but y is vertical. So we're gonna start by writing r and r in terms of x, and then use the function to write x in terms of y. So just like copy these three bullet points and paste them and then change vertical y's to horizontal x's. So what that means, once we write down the volume of the slice, and it has these two R's in it, we have to go back to our picture and label where these R's are. So little r goes from the axis of rotation to the near end of the slice. So I'm gonna put little r in here. Big R has to go from the axis of rotation to the far end of the slice. So big R is gonna go there. I know I'm gonna to have to write these in terms of X. So I'm gonna to have to label X and Y. So I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna pick a point, the, pick the, find the point where the slice intersects the graph with the function attached and label X. And label Y. Now I am ready to write big R and little r in terms of x and then use the function to write x in terms of y. If we look at big R, big R goes from the axis of rotation to the far end of the slice and the far end of the slice is always gonna be sitting on the y axis. So big R is going to be, the right side is at nine, and the left side is at y equals zero. So the big R is constant at nine. Notice that little r starts off at nine and ends at the curvy part. So little r is going to be nine minus, and then the rest of this piece is x. but I need to write r and r in terms of y because it's a delta y integral that we're trying to build. So that's where the function comes into it. Since y is equal to square root of x, we can write x as y squared and put that in to our little r. Now I have expressions for big R and little r in terms of y. I'm ready to put them into the volume of the slice. So the volume of the slice is gonna be pi times big R, which is nine squared minus little r, which is nine minus y squared squared times the delta y. Now I've got a formula for the volume of each slice. I just took the cross-sectional area multiplied by the height like we always do. And I assumed that the cross-sectional area was constant for some small change in the height because I want to use multiplication, but one of my factors is variable. So now I'm gonna add up all the volumes of the slices and turn that into a definite integral. I'm gonna switch from our discrete sum to a continuous sum so the discrete sum in the Riemann sum to a continuous sum by taking the number of slices to infinity. All that means is that I'm gonna write the volume total uh, 
I skip the part in the volume of the slice where I add them all up and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. I, I, I know uh, Riemann probably feels bad. It's like, oh, come on, man. How could you be ignoring me like that? How you do me like that? I'm like, oh, dude, you got a whole hypothesis. That's one of the millennium problems. So I don't think you should be worrying about all the students skipping your Riemann sum. And then Riemann's like, oh, yeah, totally. You're right. I do have, still have that hypothesis. And then, and then it's pretty dope. So, I mean, it's way cooler than the sum. Although a lot less accessible. So now we're integrating pi. I'm going to simplify nine squared to whatever that is, 81. I'm just going to leave this like this because I know I'm going to be punching it into a calculating machine and I don't want to mess it up. The discrete delta y in my Riemann sum that I didn't write becomes the continuous dy in my definite integral. And now we got to remember this is a dy, so I got to integrate over all the y's that have a slice. So, so we're not going to integrate, put zero for some reason, uh, we're not going to integrate from zero to nine because those are the x's where we see slices. We need to integrate y equals zero to y equals three. And now we've finished setting up our definite integral. So now we can grab our calculator and we can pi math nine, 81 minus a nine minus y squared squared with respect to y from zero to three because it's a y integral. And we get 356.26. And then we're done. Now notice that this is different than the previous one because I'm not finding the same region or I'm not finding the same solid. I use the same region, but I'm going around a completely different axis. So we should expect a different value. The reason that it's really important that we hit all these details, the reason I am emphasizing this process and all these details is that our intuition is not gonna be very helpful trying to calculate these values. Um, we don't have things like pi r squared to base this off of, or you know, four thirds pi r cubed to base this off of. We're finding the region of this really weirdly defined solid. So um, I forgot where I was going with that. We're, we don't have, it's not like we're, we're finding the area of a triangle. And so we could compare what our answer to one half base times height. We don't have that built in already. We've got these weirdly defined solid objects and we want to find their volume. We don't have nice formulas for them. Fortunately, we know that volume is just cross-sectional area multiplied by height. That's all we need. Any questions? Oh, and it looks like if I divide this by pi, I'm guessing that there's a multiple of pi here. So if I divide it by pi, um, we get 113.4. So 567 over five pi. I suppose I could just find this out by um, going back, oops, going back to my, just dropping the pi. Not exactly a headline. Mathematician overcomplicates things. It's not really, that's not news. All right. So the, one of the things that we want to notice about this is that there's a lot of analytic geometry. We spend most of our time doing the analytic geometry stuff. The good news is that when we have a region, we have lots of way, de depending on what the region looks like, we have lots of prop, we can get a lot of practice problems out of it because we can have 
here we have x equals nine. We could try it with a different vertical axis, say at x equals 10, see what changes in any of the calculations. You can take the axis and put it at the y axis and slice perpendicular. You can try an axis that's a vertical axis, say at negative one, that's detached, but on the other side. Or you can try vertical axes. We did y equals three. We did y equals five. We could try the x-axis or x equals negative one. And we can see how those things change. So there's like um, four places where you could put an axis and rotate this same region and practice setting up integrals. I try to be very specific about um, not just the steps that we're following, but why we're following those steps so we can adapt the method to different regions and different locations for axes. But as soon as we write down this region, it's got to a horizontal and a, vert a, horizontal and a vertical uh, boundary. So there are like six problems that we can build out of this horizontal at the boundary, horizontal above the boundary, horizontal below the region, vertical at the boundary, vertical um, right of the region, vertical left of the region. Lots of problems you can get out of one region. And that's super efficient. Tomorrow, we'll look at number two. We're going to think about what happens when we slice parallel to the axis of rotation. And we got to think about what's the shape going to be. All right, that's going to do it for today. Um, I will see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.